Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. As of July 2015, South Korea's central bank owned foreign exchange reserves worth over 370 billion U.S. dollars, an astounding amount. This so-called war chest is a direct result of South Korea's painful experience during the Asian crisis in 1997-1998. Confronted with massive capital flight, as foreign investors demanded repayment for the loans they had granted Korean firms, which were mostly denominated in U.S. dollars, the Korean central bank quite literally ran out of foreign currency. In effect, the Korean private sector could not get hold of enough U.S. dollars and other major foreign currencies to pay back their cross-border debts. The situation led to a severe financial crisis, which left South Korea no choice but to petition the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, for help. The Asian crisis took a severe toll on Korea. Corporate bankruptcy rates skyrocketed, and over 2 million people lost their jobs. To prevent future economic downturns from leading into another foreign exchange crisis, the Korean Central Bank has been building up massive foreign currency reserves ever since. While this is arguably a rational policy, is it necessarily an optimal strategy in today's world? Our guest for this episode, Young Won Cho, argues that South Korea's foreign exchange hoarding also implies significant opportunity costs, and that a significant share of this war chest would be best allocated elsewhere. South Korea's attempt to invest its massive reserves has yielded, so far, mixed results. Yongwon Cho is associate professor at St. Francis Xavier University in Canada, and visiting scholar at Korea University's Asiatic Research Institute in Seoul. He is a specialist in financial globalization and emerging markets, as well as in the regional security complex in East Asia. Professor Cho has published in several academic journals, including the Journal of Contemporary Asia, Pacific Focus, and the Journal of East Asian Affairs. Professor Cho received his BA from Carleton University and earned his MA and PhD from Queens. Professor Cho, welcome to Korea in the World. Thank you. You recently published an article about South Korea's foreign exchange reserves entitled, When 262 Billion is Not Enough, Rethinking Reserve Accumulation in South Korea. It appears that the South Korean Central Bank is sitting on a staggering amount of foreign currency, which it has been building up since the Asian financial crisis in 97. So before we talk about this, this whole topic, can you maybe define for our listeners what foreign exchange reserves are and maybe why should we care? Well, the simple uh, definition is uh, foreign currency denominated assets that are held by uh, central banks. But there are additional sort of criteria. Uh, one is that they have to be liquid. So we're not talking about you know, Bank of Korea owning some real estate in California. Mm-hmm. That doesn't qualify as reserves. And the second thing is that it has to be a foreign currency that is uh, what is known in the market as hard currency. Uh, US dollar denominated most of it, uh, mm-hmm. and then there's euro, some of it in Japanese yen, some of it in the Swiss franc, etc. etc. So even if uh, Central Bank of Korea holds a bunch of I don't know, Mexican peso denominated financial assets, they are not really uh, taken into account. Mm-hmm. Research, yes. So what happened in 97 that triggered this massive hoarding? What was the motive behind it? All Koreans know what happened in 1997. <laughs> uh, some of the uh, non-Koreans might not be familiar with it. Uh, what happened in 1997, of course, is the broader Asian uh, financial crisis. And Korea was very much caught up uh, in the regional crisis. In fact, its crisis was a very, very severe, worst uh, economic financial crisis in Korea's history. As to why that was a factor for the uh, Bank of Korea to start accumulating a lot of resources, uh, is because in 1997, Bank of Korea had about $30 billion uh, in reserves, which it thought was you know, more than enough because the, back then, about 20 years ago, the traditional benchmark to measure uh, appropriate level of reserves focused on the uh, current account, that is on the trade side, as opposed to a capital account, the financial flows, right? Mm-hmm. And the rule of thumb was about three months of imports. And $30 billion covered about three months of imports for South Korea. Because you need foreign currencies to uh, buy foreign assets. Yeah. yeah, That's that's why you need reserves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that was the traditional traditional, uh, need for, right? In 1997, when the crisis broke out, uh, it was not so much uh, uh, the traditional debt crisis that you know a lot of developing countries went through in the 1980s, for instance, but rather uh, the crisis originated from the capital account, that is 
with capital flows, yeah. sudden reversal of uh, foreign capital flows into Korea. So foreign investors demanding basically their money back. Exactly. And they wanted that money back in US dollars well, with other currencies. and Yeah, because mm. you know they, the vast majority of the uh, external liability is run up by uh, Korean banks and, and, and private companies mm. and whatnot. They were denominated in foreign currency, mostly in US dollars, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, when the foreign banks uh, demanded their money back, Korean banks had to come up with dollars. Mm. So in a sense, what happened in 1997 is that Bank of Korea tried to act as a lender of last resort. Uh, lender of last resort refers to a central bank usually. Uh, this is when uh, central banks will extend the financing to you know, banks and financial institutions uh, when they cannot borrow money from anyone else, right? There's, mm-hmm. a, say, a panic in the market. And when it comes to domestic currency, central banks can do that because they can create money out of thin air, right? They mm-hmm. just credit uh, into the accounts. The problem with uh, external financial crisis is that Bank of Korea was trying to act as a land of last resort uh, in a currency that it doesn't control, that it can't simply mm. create, right? It would have to be US dollars. And so it was running out of reserves. Uh, and as a result of that, it ended up you know, going into a serious financial crisis. It eventually had to ask the International Monetary Fund for assistance. If you look at some of the countries, uh, there were not as badly affected by the crisis in the region. Uh, there was China, uh, there was Taiwan. Now China back in those days, uh, capital account was pretty much closed. So there was no free mobility of capital mm-hmm. in or out of China. And if you look at Taiwan or Singapore, what everyone noticed was that they had huge amounts of reserves. And that was one of the biggest uh, factors behind uh, why it is that Taiwan and Singapore uh, did relatively better than other uh, Asian countries. Because they were able to offset the shock of uh, yeah, they had external basically. investors asking for them. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can think of reserves as being sort of a, a rainy fund or war chest. Mm. So if there is a crisis of confidence or whatnot, then central banks can mobilize their reserves, right? So $30 billion uh, was clearly not enough. And as a result, uh, South Korean economy went into a severe crisis. So there was that lesson. Um, mm. that in order to prevent another occurrence of what happened in 1997, Bank of Korea should uh, accumulate more and more reserves. So we understand the rationale of building these reserves, uh, given the, the Asian financial crisis uh, experience of Korea. But is it rational to continue building up reserves to such a massive extent? Why has Korea not stopped doing so once it reached a, a safe amount? Uh, your paper, as I mentioned, was titled When 262 Billion is Not Enough, but I think currently South Korea's foreign exchange reserves stand at over $370 billion. It's completely irrational in one sense, uh, but it is also thoroughly rational in another uh, sense. Now, to the extent that there is actually a compelling a rational, a compelling reason uh, or motivation behind reserve hoarding, it is at least quite understandable why it is that it has been accumulating a lot of reserves. We'll probably end up talking about this, but I want to uh, point out that reserve accumulation, reserve hoarding is not unique to Korea. Mm. Practically every emerging market in developing countries have been engaged in this behavior in the last decade or 15 years or so. There is a reason uh, behind uh, this behavior, and we can talk about this uh, later on. Uh, on the other hand, to the extent that reserve hoarding or reserve accumulation uh, does entail hefty cost, it is quite irrational for South Korea to continue to pile up more reserves because the more reserves they accumulate, the more cost a bank of Korea is incurring or the Korean economy as a whole is observing. So you mentioned the cost of building up foreign exchange reserves. Uh, in your paper, you talk about a self-help strategy and that reserve accumulation is a costly form of self-insurance neither sufficient nor efficient in guarding against the volatility of global financial markets. So I think the first question would be, how can having a war chest of foreign currencies be costly? What are the costs that South Korea is incurring uh, in exchange for sustaining these reserves? There is a tendency, and this is especially pronounced among Koreans, to see uh, reserves as uh, some sort of an indicator of economic strength. So if you uh, turn to newspapers, uh, there's almost nationalistic expression, you know, our reserves have you know, broken the record again, uh, that sort of thing. But actually, uh, reserves are not cost-free. They are, in fact, very, very costly. To understand this in easier terms, sort of layman's terms, think about stashing some big amount of cash under your mattress. 
you think at first that there is really no economic cost associated with it because you think, you know, I'm not really losing any money. Mm-hmm. And if I stash away $10,000 under my mattress, next day it's still there. But you have to think in terms of opportunity cost, right? Instead of stashing that money under your mattress, you could have invested. You could have purchased stocks, you could have you know, purchased bonds, you could have even put into a savings account, etc., etc., which would have given you a better return than you know, just putting it away uh, under your mattress, right? So in that sense, reserves are uh, quite costly because there is foregone opportunity cost. And this has to do with the fact that the rates of return on reserves tend to be very, very poor. Now, central banks do not hold their you know, foreign exchange reserves in cash. You know, they're not holding literally greenbacks, right, um, uh, US dollars. Uh, they do hold some amount of uh, currencies, but most of it is invested actually. Mm-hmm. But they're invested in very uh, liquid and uh, safe uh, instruments. And they are typically uh, government bonds issued by uh, industrialized countries, mm-hmm. right? The biggest one being the U.S. So they invest their reserves into uh, U.S. Treasury bills, uh, U.S. government bonds, and the Japanese yen denominated, euro denominated government bonds, etc., etc. Everyone knows that the rates of return on those instruments are very, very low, mm-hmm. uh, just because of you know, their nature, right? They're very safe. They don't carry much risk. So the rates of return on, on reserve assets are very poor, whereas the cost or the opportunity cost of uh, accumulating reserves tend to be a lot higher. Now, we can think of you know, how to measure this cost in several uh, ways. Uh, and this is you know, what you would find when you turn to the economic literature about mm. you know, reserve policy and, and the cost of reserves. So one measure is looking at the impact of reserve accumulation on the balance sheet of the central bank. Jargon that is used to describe this cost is a quasi-fiscal cost. When Bank of Korea accumulates reserves, foreign exchange reserves, what it has to do, of course, is it has to purchase U.S. dollars, right? Mm. And it does that by intervening in the current markets. When it purchases U.S. dollars, in return, it sells Korean won. What this means is that there is now more local currency in the system, so the money uh, supply increases. And this uh, tends to generate inflationary pressures. So to prevent that, uh, the central bank would engage in what is known as sterilization Mm. by engaging in open market operations. What the bank does is that it would issue government bonds and in that way, it can sort of mop up the excess liquidity created by its intervention in the currency market. Mm. Problem with this is that the government bonds that Bank of Korea issues to you know, mop up the excess liquidity created by its uh, intervention in the currency market, they carry much higher interest rates than the assets that Bank of Korea has. Right, so let's say U.S. Treasury bills or government bonds. I don't know what the rate of return is nowadays, but Treasury bills probably around one percent or less. Mm. Even government bonds around one percent, whereas uh, government bonds uh, floated in Korea would be I don't know three or four percent. Definitely higher, much higher than. Uh, so that spread is is a cost. Bank of Korea is facing a reverse margin, right? And you also have to take into account the impact of exchange rates. So if you go back to the 2000s, what happened over that time was that there was a general weakening of the U.S. dollars. And most of the assets that Bank of Korea has, of course, are denominated in U.S. dollars, about 65% or so. And so Bank of Korea was also getting hammered by the exchange rate impact. So there is that cost uh, for the uh, central bank. This is somewhat concerning, and the political controversy or the debate in the mid-2000s in Korea evolved around this cost. The central bank was essentially losing money because mm-hmm. the assets it held was giving it very poor returns, whereas its liabilities, you have to pay a lot more in terms of the interest uh, uh, rate costs. But this is not really the most relevant uh, mm-hmm. metric f- uh, from the national or the macro perspective, and the reason is because when a Bank of Korea uh, engages in sterilization and uh, issues uh, government bonds, uh, the counterpart to that transaction is predominantly domestic residents. What I meant by that is that it's actually mostly Koreans who end up purchasing those government bonds issued by uh, Bank of Korea, right? So the interest payment goes from the public sector to the Korean private sector, right? 
Now I know that in the recent years there has been you know more uh, investment for investment in the uh, in the fixed income market in Korea, but still you know, predominantly it purchase uh, domestic uh, domestic entities. So it's tantamount to uh, transfer income from the public to the private sector. So that, I don't think that's the most relevant issue. And there is another uh, side to it which has to do with the exchange rate impact. This is sort of a book loss or gains, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not really. Uh, realized until Bank of Korea proceeds to liquidate its uh, reserve holdings. And that doesn't really happen, uh, per se. So it's a concern uh, in terms of the balance sheet of the central bank, but you know, from the macro perspective, it is not really the most relevant uh, measure. There's a couple of other uh, ways to think of cost. The biggest or the broadest measure is the opportunity cost of reserves as defined by foregone consumption with investment. Mm. The idea is that, you know, what would have happened if instead of adding to the reserves that is purchasing a bunch of U.S. government bonds, if that money had been invested mm-hmm. in Korea, right? Now you wrote that reserve accumulation expressed in terms of foregone investment is staggeringly high. It is very high, uh, at least according to the calculations that I've done. That is the broadest uh, measure. And the third uh, measure, the metric that I, 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 I used in, in my paper, has to do with the cost of reserves conceptualizing as a reverse carry trade. Yeah, I think you have to explain that, that concept. Carry trade entails borrowing cheaply and then investing in or lending it uh, expensively, right? So uh, back in the 1990s, and I think it's a lot of it still happening, uh, some of the listeners might remember that the Japanese economy, well, it still is in trouble, but was in, in trouble uh, back in those days. Uh, and Bank of uh, Japan essentially pursued a 0% uh, percent interest rate policy, uh, so money could be raised very cheaply in yen. And what the Japanese banks and other uh, uh, countries' banks did was they would borrow a bunch of money uh, from Japan. And then lend it in, in a foreign yen. currency. Yeah, and lend it in dollars to Thailand. To With a higher yeah, 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 interest rate. Yeah, higher interest rates, right? So if I were to sort of engage in this kind of carry trade, what I would do is that I would borrow money from, uh, from my, my bank, say at, I don't know, 3%, and then invest it into stock market, you know, hoping that it's going to generate 7 or 8% returns, right? And I can still come out ahead. Now, the reverse carry trade is, is the reverse of it, which is you borrow money, you raise money expensively, uh, and then invest it in assets that actually generate returns that are lower than you know the cost of, of raising the capital, right? And this is relevant because if you look at the rationale behind reserve accumulation, again, I want to emphasize this is not unique to uh, Korea. This has been going on uh, across the developing world and emerging markets. There is, in the policy circle, in, at the IMF, for instance, there was this idea in the aftermath of the Asian uh, financial crisis, and prior to that, of course, there was the Mexican crisis and the effects, and then in 1998, there was a whole bunch of other uh, crises in the emerging uh, markets. There was Russia, there was Brazil, there was Turkey, and there were dozens and dozens of crises. And one of the policy lessons that evolved out of these, uh, these crises was that developing countries and emerging markets uh, should improve their asset side of their liquidity position, their international investment positions, you know, which is another way of saying that you, know, you have to accumulate more reserves. You gotta hoard more reserve just in case foreign investors and creditors want their money back. Mm. And uh, this came to be known as um, the Girodi uh, Greenspan principle. It is named after uh, Pablo Girodi, who is the former deputy finance minister of Argentina. And Alan Greenspan, the famous Alan Greenspan, who is the former uh, chair of the Fed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the principle basically says that uh, developing countries and emerging markets ought to back every dollar of short-term external liabilities with a dollar in reserves. So if, say, Mexico has $10 billion in short-term external liabilities, it ought to have at least $10 billion in reserves. 100% cover. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But this is just the starting point. This, this is not necessarily saying that this, that's going to be enough, but bare minimum, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and clearly, this is not the benchmark that was used uh, by Korea. Anyways, I go back to this idea because if you look at or measure the uh, the cost of reserves as a reverse carry trade, 
instead of using Mexico, let's go back to uh, South Korea. Let's say the Korean uh, economy has you know, $100 billion in short-term external liabilities. So following this recommendation, and by the way, this recommendation was endorsed by the IMF. Mm-hmm. Uh, following this recommendation, Bank of Korea ought to accumulate $100 billion in reserves, right? Mm-hmm. 100% backup. Now, when Korean banks or Korean firms borrow money from abroad, the interest rates they pay on it is much higher than the returns to the central bank on reserve assets, right? So commercial banks, say, I don't know, Korean bank borrowing money from a European bank or American bank, the interest rates would, you know, just hypothetically, we could say it's 5% or 4% a year. Whereas, you know, the, those treasury bills and the government, U.S. government bonds that the Bank of Korea holds, you know, they, it's giving them about 1% or 2% at most mm-hmm. in returns, right? So there's a, there's a reverse margin. That is another way to conceptualize and try to calculate uh, the cost of reserves, which I think is, is, is more relevant. It's also more uh, precise than uh, the other uh, the opportunity cost as, mm-hmm. as foregone investment or consumption. As you mentioned, South Korea still suffered from a quite severe credit crunch during the global financial crisis of 2008. The Korean Central Bank saw its reserves again sink rapidly and had to request help from the U.S. Federal Reserve to guarantee the availability of U.S. dollars to Korean firms. You also write that without the U.S. assistance, South Korea would probably have been forced to ask help from the IMF again. Isn't this the very proof that the South Korean war shift will indeed never be enough? In a sense, yes. As I jokingly tell, reserves to central bankers are sort of like what shoes are to my wife. <laughs> they can never have enough. But it is technically possible to uh, have enough reserves. All you actually need is uh, sufficient reserves to cover uh, all the sources of capital drain. So we're talking about all uh, short-term external liabilities, which is covered by the Girodi uh, Greenspan principle, mm-hmm. plus foreign portfolio investment, which is also quite mobile and quite uh, quite liquid and, and can at times be quite uh, unstable. So if you have accumulated enough reserves to cover all those sources, then yeah, then you have enough reserves. The question, of course, is that or how costly that is going to be. According to my calculation, uh, back in 2008, you know, right before the crisis, uh, the global financial crisis broke, Bank of Korea had around $262 billion. I think it, at one point it had $264 billion. But at the beginning of 2008, that's how much uh, money it had. It would still have needed about $450 billion more. That's a lot of money. And the cost would obviously be uh, prohibitively high, right? But to answer uh, your uh, other question, what would you rather have, $262 billion or $30 billion? <laughs> if you had a central banker, you would you know, obviously sleep a lot easier if you had you know, $262 billion better than uh, $30 billion. So, I mean, my paper is very critical of reserve accumulation. But, you know, my criticism is not so much about central banks accumulating reserves, but rather uh, it is about the rationale behind all all the driving forces uh, behind it. So given the circumstances, given, you know, relatively uh, small policy room or the space to find alternatives to address this problem of financial instability, I think it is understandable and I also think it is quite, quite necessary almost unavoidable for Bank of Korea to pursue this policy of accumulating reserves. It's very unfortunate. I wish it didn't have to uh, do it, but the alternatives uh, so far, not that many, I guess. What would be the alternatives really quickly? You know, how do you improve your liquidity position? How do you improve your international investment position so that you know, when there is all of a sudden foreign creditors and investors uh, demanding their money back, you have enough liquid assets to pay them back? One way, which is what South Korea and, and, and nearly all emerging market and developing countries have been doing, is accumulate reserves, you know, mm-hmm. improve the asset side, right? So set aside a lot of money for the rainy days. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, of course, is the other side of the investment position or the liquidity position, which is liabilities, short-term liabilities. So the alternative is to reduce the amount of flight-prone uh, capital that is sitting on top. This includes, again, you know, short-term external liabilities, 
but also uh, foreign portfolio investment, which again, you know, can be quite uh, unstable and uh, destabilizing. Because isn't this the crux of the problem? Is that South Korean companies need access to foreign capital. However, when there is a crisis in 97, 2008, the first thing for foreign investors want is their money back, so they can reinvest it in the safest assets they can find, mostly U.S. Treasury bills or assets that dominate in Swiss francs or whatnot, until the situation becomes more favorable. But South Korea is now a top 20 economy. The Korean one is relatively stable. Inflation is under control. It's a strong domestic consumer market. So why do foreign investors always run away from Korea the minute there seems to be trouble either regionally or globally? And it does make sense for investors to flee emerging markets when trouble is brewing. But in the case of South Korea, it's part of the OECD club. So shouldn't this be a thing of the past? You could have said the same thing about Korea back in 1997. In mm-hmm. fact, I think in 1997, the relative ranking of the Korean economy as a in terms of the size was around 12. So it was even bigger or at least ranked higher uh, in the world economy. Uh, the one had been very, very stable and the reason is partly because it had uh, you know, almost packed uh, exchange rates. Uh, inflation rates were very, very low. Uh, consumption was very, very strong. So the macroeconomic situation uh, of South Korea back in 1997 was you know, was quite strong. Mm. I think this says more about the nature of the uh, global financial system than uh, in general and global finance, in particular than uh, Korea or other country, any other country for that matter. There, there is pervasive information problems uh, when it comes to a uh, global financial system, particularly when it comes to financial intermedi- intermediation uh, to developing and emerging markets. The market tends to be uh, very prone to uh, episodes of euphoria uh, mm-hmm. and panic as well. And it has a marked tendency to generate a uh, self-fulfilling uh, crisis. And, and again, foreign investors, foreign creditors run and flee from uh, not just Korea, but from you know, all kinds of different uh, emerging market economies. You know, I come back to this question of you know why you know foreign investors are prone to this uh, when when Korea is you know, part of the OECD. But let me let me go back to your question about the need uh, for South Korean companies to tap into mm-hmm. the international capital markets. As to this idea that Korea needs access to foreign capital, it is not as clear cut as it appears at first. And the reason is because Korea is actually a net, a huge net saver. So its problem is not lack of capital because you know savings rate in Korea is still very very high, right? I don't have the exact figure, but I imagine it's still around thirty percent. Uh, so it's a lot higher than what it is in the United States, for instance, for sure, or other yeah. uh, uh, industrialized countries. So the problem is not lack of capital or low savings rate in Korea, but rather it is lack of or, or lackluster, excuse me, uh, domestic consumption, which is. Mm-hmm. Problematic in the in the recent years, and as well as lackluster uh, investment. So reserve accumulation actually means that Korea is exporting capital, and you know I'm going to go back to this uh, principle, the Kirori uh, Brisbane principle, uh, the idea that uh, emerging markets ought to back every dollar of short-term liabilities uh, with a dollar in reserves. If you take a closer look at it, what this means is that there is actually no net financial resource transfer from abroad, mm. right? So money comes in, Korean banks borrows money from abroad, say $10 billion, but Bank of Korea accumulates, offsets it by accumulating $10 billion in reserve assets, right? That's the money that goes back to, well, predominantly the United States. So there is actually no net financial resource transfer in this instance. For the listeners to, to try to explain this in, in, in somewhat simpler terms, uh, think about a household borrowing from a bank. So I go to my bank and I borrow, I don't know, $10,000 uh, from the bank and say the interest rate charged uh, is 5%. But this is a, this is a, a sort of a revolving line of credit. Uh, the bank can demand the money back anytime it wants to. And let's say that, again, as I mentioned, I borrow $10,000. Uh, $10, and then, you know, a few weeks down the road or a month or two months down the road, the bank calls me up all of a sudden and tells me, look, you got to pay me back. I want my money back. Mm-hmm. And I almost, you know, go into a financial crisis. Well, I go, I do go into a financial crisis. Because I've had that experience, and this is sort of akin to South Korea going through the crisis in 1997. It pours money, you know, when times are good. When it starts raining, you know, they want their umbrella back. So mm-hmm. like what you know, Mark Twain said about bankers, right? So 
because I went through that experience, uh, I decide just in case you know my bank will want its money back. Uh, I bought another ten thousand dollars from the bank, and instead of actually con you know using it to consume, buying a, I don't know some gadgets or whatnot, or uh, using it to invest in something, say you know I would pursue my my education, you know pay for my uh, university education, etc. etc. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I'm afraid that uh, the bank is going to uh, want its money back, I actually put it back into the bank's savings account. I borrow it for 5%, I put it back, right back into the uh, bank's savings account. Which it provides me, me only 1%. Yeah, 1%, right? Does it make any economic sense? No. It doesn't. But this is what is happening with reserve accumulation. Hmm. There is, in this instance, you know, no uh, new consumption and there is no new investment either. What is happening is that I'm actually subsidizing the bank. If you look at you know, the overall picture, the global picture in terms of reserve accumulation, I've actually written a, another paper on this, uh, is that the vast majority of reserves are being accumulated by emerging markets and developing countries. This is not a phenomenon that is affecting uh, industrialized countries, with the exception of Japan and, and Switzerland. Developed market economies, you know, their reserve holdings uh, still hover around three months of uh, imports, which is the traditional benchmark. Whereas for uh, emerging markets and developed countries, it's like 10 months, mm. 11 or 12 months, right? So it's the, actually the poor countries that have been accumulating these reserves. What this means is it's actually the poor countries that have been subsidizing consumption by you know far richer industrialized countries predominantly instead Mexico's of investing economy. in their own economy yeah instead of investing in their own economies using that example of household borrowing money from uh, from the bank and then putting it right back into the uh, bank's uh, savings account uh, basically the same thing is happening when uh, countries accumulate reserves uh, same thing happening with South Korea's uh, reserve hoarding as well so from 1998 right after the crisis 1997 up until 2012 which is uh, fairly recent Korea actually posted a net capital transfer to abroad. Hmm. This is money, the capital leaving Korea to another country, predominantly the United States again. Uh, $330 billion. It's a lot of money. This would not be so bad if those $330 billion went into you know, investing abroad in assets that actually produce some you know, reasonably respectable rates of return, right? You know, four or five percent. But they actually went into U.S. Treasury bills and U.S. government bonds and Euro, you know, nominated government mm. bonds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which again pay large returns, right? Mm. So as you mentioned in your paper, the the debt troubles during the 1997 financial crisis resulted from South Korea's financial deregulation because suddenly uh, firms were allowed to contract massive amounts of short-term debt denominated in foreign currencies, and as you explained, suddenly they had to pay it back and they couldn't. But as you show in your research, Korean corporations have again resorted to the same financial schemes. Almost 50% of Korea's corporate external debt and 70% of the external debt of Korean banks is short term. So why is this still authorized by the Korean legislator and how does this compare with other nations? Um, I think the rates have come down quite a bit in mm -hmm. recent years. That figure is, uh, was on the eve of the global financial crisis in, in, in 2008. The part, predominant reason is because uh, in the aftermath of the, the crisis of 1997, Korea went through uh, extensive economic reforms, uh, economic transformation, and as a part of the IMF sponsored or imposed, if you would, uh, structural adjustment programs, uh, South Korea uh, implemented you know, a very sweeping capital account liberalization that is opening up uh, its financial markets uh, to foreign investors and creditors. Plus, there has been still ease, I think, uh, a lot of ideological um, diversity to this idea of reintroducing capital controls. Uh, so the monetary authorities or the government of the legislators have been very reluctant to implement any kind of radical measures to reintroduce capital controls. Now, having said that, to be fair, uh, South Korean government has introduced some capital flow related uh, measures uh, in recent years, especially in the aftermath of 2008 crisis. And one has to do with the limits on foreign exchange derived contracts that have been imposed. Uh, I think it's 50% of capital base for uh, Korean banks and 250% for Korean branches of foreign banks. 
Uh, another one is uh, what the government calls uh, medical prudential stability levi, which is a small sort of a tax, I guess, a small fee mm. uh, that is imposed on short-term uh, external liabilities. And I think it's annualized at uh, 20 basis uh, points. So the government has begun to implement some, some measures. But of course, there has not been uh, any sort of sweeping uh, uh, measures in terms of trying to control these, uh, these uh, volatile uh, sources of uh, capital flows. We talked about foregone investments earlier. Um, South Korea has decided to make something out of these huge reserves, it seems, and has set up its own sovereign wealth fund called the Korea Investment Corporation. This is the topic of another academic paper you presented in August this year at the World Congress for Korean Politics and Society. Can you maybe explain for our listeners what a sovereign wealth fund is and what purpose it serves? Uh, Sovereign wealth funds are investment funds that are owned by uh, and controlled by states. They serve several purposes. It all depends on on which specific uh, sovereign wealth fund that we're talking about. Uh, Some do take on sort of a strategic uh, dimension in relation to the pursuit of some sort of broader national foreign policy objectives. Others basically do what any other fund does, which is pursuing profits or trying to maximize uh, returns. As you mentioned, um, many of sovereign wealth funds buy strategic assets abroad, and so they have been accused of having some kind of a political agenda in some countries. So what is the objective of the Korea Investment Corporation, the KIC, and do you see a risk of mercantilist foul play there? The primary uh, purpose uh, of Korea Investment Corporation uh, is to serve as a vehicle to mitigate or reduce uh, the cost of reserves that we've been talking about by investing a portion of Korea's massive reserve holdings into higher yielding assets. So instead of just you know buying a bunch of U.S. Treasury bills or government bonds. Uh, you would buy other types of uh, financial assets that would, you know, generate higher returns. At a higher risk as yeah, well. Well, yeah, of course, it would mean a higher risk, yeah. uh, obviously. At the time uh, uh, when the KIC was formed, there was a sort of a secondary uh, objectives behind it. Uh, there was a lot of talk about using the KIC uh, to turn Seoul into a regional financial hub, sort of like, you know, what Hong Kong and mm-hmm. Singapore is. And the idea was that the KIC would uh, provide a lot of investable funds uh, and thereby attract a number of multinational asset management firms uh, to Seoul. Right? But the real motivation behind the whole initiative was to deal with the problem of the cost of uh, reserve mm. accumulation. Uh, as for the risk of mercantilism creeping in, with KIC, I don't think there is any basis to uh, be concerned about that or any, any basis to accuse uh, KIC of you know, being a mercantilist tool for the Korean state. Because you know, you, when you look at the investment portfolio of KIC, I sound mean here, but there's nothing strategic about it. <laughs> I think the, the, the latest uh, controversy over KIC's investment decision is a botched one. Uh, it failed, it didn't go through. It was uh, they're trying to purchase a major league baseball team, I think LA Dodgers. Oh. Right? Yeah. Well, I guess I suppose there could be a strategy behind it. Hopefully, in terms of, a good yield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in terms of you know pursuing some sort of broader national you know, foreign policy objectives, I don't think it's, mm. it's, it's, it's relevant. So coming back to our topic, is this the solution to South Korea's foreign exchange reserves problem and the costs uh, you were talking about? Is investing the money into something useful a good way to mitigate the costs? It, it could be, but it is not, at least not, not so far, because there are a bunch of things that are you know, fairly unique to KIC that have uh, prevented it from you know, fulfilling its primary objective, which is you know, generating higher returns. If the KIC has uh, sufficient uh, room to actually pursue you know, higher risk and higher return uh, investment strategy, then of course it would mitigate or reduce you know, the problem of the cost of reserve accumulation. The problem here is that uh, it has not been uh, given that room, and ergo, it has not been actually meeting its objective, the primary mm. purpose. I think the, the next question would be, is this the, re- the return in some way of the developmental state? Um, because government-directed investment sounds a lot like 
the Korea of the past, the Korea of the 1970s. And I don't necessarily mean it in a negative way, but, you know, is this somehow a shift in, 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 in policy, really? No. And, and the reason is because it's true that there is a widespread perception or at least concern about sovereign wealth fund. Because if you look at sovereign wealth funds, many of them are owned uh, and run by states that are you know, considered to be pursuing you know, uh, state capitalism or or state-led uh, economic development, uh, China being you know, the most predominant example. But in the case of Korea, uh, it, it does not indicate the return or the potential return of the uh, developmental uh, state or government-directed investment because, again, you have to look at kind of assets that the KIC have been uh, investing and purchasing. Uh, what it has been doing is really not that different from what Bank of Korea has been doing with its own reserve uh, management. So basically, the specific types of assets or investment that KIC makes, of course, is you know, different from the, the investment that Bank of Korea makes on its own in managing its, uh, its uh, reserve uh, portfolio, asset portfolio. But broadly speaking, the types have been pretty much the same. Uh, the number of reasons behind this, KIC does face a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but you know, specific legislative limits in terms of what it can do and what it cannot do. Uh, it also faces fairly strict uh, contractual obligations with the Bank of Korea. And probably the biggest reason is because KIC does not actually invest its own money. Mm. It doesn't have its own capital. The money it invests is entrusted uh, money, predominantly from Bank of Korea. The money that is being managed, the assets that are being managed by KIC, most of them, the exact Percentage is not disclosed. There's a lot. Of, there's a problem with transparency uh, with KIC, so it's very difficult to find out, uh, you, know, you know, the extent of uh, how the assets are distributed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but most of the uh, assets are still defined and categorized as being reserves. So when Bank of Korea gives and trusts, you know, tens of billions of dollars to the KIC. It's not tell, It's not saying to the KIC, look, you know, here's the money. You can use it to invest in you know, higher risk and uh, higher return uh, assets. Instead, what it's saying is that here is the money, but those are still reserves. So sit on it. Yeah, basically, right? Hmm. Which means that you have to invest it in safe instruments, and you also have to invest in highly liquid investments, right? Hmm. But there's a limit in terms of how aggressive KIC can actually be. So you look at the asset portfolio of KIC, about 90% of its assets uh, are still uh, what is known as traditional assets. Again, they don't come out and say specifically what is meant by traditional assets. They, we do know it's equities and bonds, and we presumably think that probably those are the assets that are defined as being reserves, right? So mm -hmm. it's counted as being part of you know, $370 billion that Bank of Korea has in reserves. Mm -hmm. And only about ten percent is uh, invested in, you know, what alternative assets, yeah, alternative like commodity or special like that, yeah. uh, assets. Fundamentally, isn't there an obvious lack of democratic control? Foreign exchange reserves are obviously a very technical subject, but given the sheer size and the financial risks that South Korea is exposed to, shouldn't citizens get to decide or at least be, you know, well informed uh, about what to do with these with these reserves? That's a very good and a very difficult question. I agree that fundamentally this does reflect lack of democratic control. But I think this is part of the broader problem uh, with economic policy making, and not just in South Korea but around the world. You know, for instance, we look at central bank, and this is part of you know central banking, right? Mm. Uh, there is a widespread, a very prevalent idea that central banks ought to be independent, right? So it is so, sort of like holy grail, I guess, right? Look at transparency in financial markets or maturity of the financial markets. You know, one of the questions asked is, you know, is the central bank independent? The idea is that central banks would pursue monetary policies independent from you know, political meddling, political pressures. The flip side to that is that you're trying to depoliticize central banks, which is another way of saying, you know, basically blocking it off. Mm and preventing democratic process uh, uh, to have any sort of significant role into it. I guess you could say, well, indirectly, people still get 
to have a voice because the governor of the central bank appointed by, you know, at least if you, if you live in a liberal democracy, elected uh, political leaders, right? Mm. Personally, I think it does indicate a you know, problem in terms of democratic deficit. But I think it's, uh, it's not just about the sort of Korean political process, the political system that is problematic. In my view, this is a global problem. Mm. Uh, this reflects, this says something about the nature and the problems of global financial system than sort of a unique or idiosyncratic problems that you know, Korea or any other emerging markets have. And that has to do with this almost uh, religious belief in free markets uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to the financial system. Uh, in the advocacy and push for a capital mobility and the fact that the global financial system is not really receptive to the needs of, of developing or emerging markets and mm. that there is you know, very much the reality of power balance underneath uh, the global financial system. So it's not so much about Korea or Brazil or Mexico and Argentina, et cetera, et cetera. Their citizens not being able to you know, have a voice in setting these policies. These countries themselves don't really have a lot of voices mm. you know, when it comes to the global financial system because they are not rule makers, they are you know, rule takers. The financial system at the global level is still very much dominated by the Western countries, and mm. I should be specific, it is dominated by the United States, and there's very little room for smaller, uh, weaker countries, even you know, in a country like South Korea, which is a lot of people think is you know, it's quite prosperous and whatnot. You touched upon it already, but would you say that the South Korean case is proof that despite all the talk about the Asian century, the financial center of gravity in the world remains the West, the US in particular. And as we saw, the second there is turmoil in the market, investors flock back to the US and other Western safe havens, even when they are themselves the cause of the crisis, as it was the case in 2008. The financial center uh, very much still remains based on, on, on in the West, particularly the United States. Uh, there, you know, a lot of people think that the United States has is in decline uh, economically, militarily, etc., etc. And people talk about you know, how China, for instance, is emerging as a, as a potential contender. I think it's too early to you know make that kind of uh, to make that call. <laughs> yeah, and the reason is because. Reserve currency still very much remains the U.S. dollar. It is not euro, it is not Japanese yen, it is not renminbi, it is not any other currency but the U.S. dollar. And there is a significant disjuncture, you know, in terms of the, uh, the material basis of U.S. economic dominance, as expressed, for instance, by the share of uh, world output, for instance, or uh, exports and imports, etc., etc. Mm. It is clearly nowhere, you know, what it used to be, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But despite that, the reserve currency still remains to U.S. dollars. And this is not something that uh, you know, I don't think is going to change anytime soon. Although people you know, talk about you know, how, how it's going to be displaced because of the underlying contradictions mm-hmm. uh, cannot be sustained. But they've been saying that since the breakdown of the brainwood system, which was you know, back in 1971, mm-hmm. 1973. So I remain very, very skeptical that so-called Asian century is about to do, you know, mm. descend upon us anytime soon. Professor Cho, thank you so much for your time today and for your technical insights. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.